Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of V Brown Bag. This is the final, final episode of V Brown Bag for the year 2020. Uh, we're very excited to have the wonderful Ayadeli Odubella on, on the line. We are tonight going to be talking about something that I've been interested and fascinated in for a little while. This, we're, the title is How to Start Doing Data Science. Um, I first started talking with our presenter this evening um, about a month ago, and we got into all the different kinds of um, shenanigans on, on a Zoom conference talking about travel and data science and fun and, uh, and, and all kinds of things. And, and uh, she has graciously, uh, in the midst of getting a new job and writing a book, what, has decided to come on and start talking to us about how to get into data science. So. Before we get into it, a couple of house show notes. Uh, get in on the conversation. If you at V Brown Bag or hashtag V Brown Bag, I will be paying attention. I will field all of your questions and, um, and then pass them on to the wonderful Miss Odabella. And if you want to follow her, you can follow her at Data Sci Bay on Twitter, D A T A S C I B A E. I, I did pronounce that correct. Data Sci Bay, is that? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as always, we have the other shows as well. We have the APAC Brazil, EMEA LATEM, and the US show, which is us. So with all of that, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, get your questions ready because this is gonna be a fantastic show. With that, I'm going to stop sharing and give you the power. Awesome, thank you so, so much. I'm so excited to get started. Um, let me make sure y'all can see this screen, okay? I love all your t-shirts, by the way. Every time I see you in a new t-shirt, I'm like, oh, that's amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I feel like I have to, you know, um, keep it a little interesting, right? You definitely bring your A. So, I appreciate that. Appreciate the recognition. Um, so I'm Maya Delio Debella, like Chris mentioned. Um, a little bit about me. I actually am a data scientist at Common ML. Um, I did my master's in data science at Regis University graduated in 26, 2018. Um, and it's funny, I actually started my career in marketing. Uh, right now, I am teaching an explainable ML course for O'Reilly Media, as well as recently published a book, uh, Getting Started in Data Science. And I'm writing another uh, for Wiley, uh, John Wiley and Sons, um, called Uncovering Bias in Machine Learning. So I'm really excited um, about all of these new works and to really just dive into what data science is and how you can get started doing it really. So the first thing we'll talk about is really the skills. What do you actually need? What is data science? Um, with that being said, it's important to understand data science as a whole is really interdisciplinary. Um, we use a lot of somewhat scientific uh, methods, processes and algorithms essentially to extract, no extract knowledge um, and insights from whatever data we have at hand. It's what we do in a nutshell, but when we start to break it down, it really comes down to three major skills. Uh, the first of that is coding. So um, for a lot of listeners, uh, this is probably right up your alley. Um, but the other two aspects, math and business sense, are really important still. Um, people tend to be intimidated by the math and the vast majority of the math needed in data science and to do it on a day-to-day -day basis is stats. Um, stats and probability are the core of pretty much everything we do. Even a lot of models like deep learning models are really just fancy ways of doing uh, linear equations. So understanding stats, probability, and linear algebra is a huge, huge, huge benefit. But even more important than that, I would genuinely say having an understanding of what kinds of business metrics are important. So if we think a little bit about the history of data science, and I separate this from the history of AI and ML that are mostly academic in nature, um, data science, especially in industry, is really about tracking and creating metrics, as well as being able to use ML to predict things that are important for our metrics, right? So we need to have an understanding of what methods work in our industry, what industry we're in, and if we are in a high stakes industry, what kinds of thresholds are acceptable? If we are predicting that someone, whether someone has cancer or not, 
um, it's really important for us to focus on certain metrics over others, right? Um, we would weigh the false positives over false negatives. So having an understanding of this business sense, um, and as it's really gotten popular, this is been a lot about product and app analytics. So a lot of my work um, has been in the product analytics side of things. And we tend to use data science as just a fancy way to try and predict um, how well our products are going to do or try and make our products better by weaving in different machine learning techniques. So I love talking about what data projects actually include. So you'll see a couple of these are highlighted. And they're highlighted because they are incredibly important and because they are the least focused on an industry. Um, I didn't want to give another data science talk that just went over the main steps of gathering data, looking at it and slicing it in different ways, and then modeling it without really talking to you about the data ethics and AI ethics issues we're having right now. So. Um, a couple of the things that you'll see highlighted are really about documentation and then kind of being a dabbled advocate, right? Um, so assessing our organization's incentives. Um, actually, I'll start from the beginning, identifying the problem. Uh, when we started data science project, of course, we're trying to solve problems, but we really should put a stronger focus on um, outlining what that problem is and then trying to build solutions that get us closer to solving it, regardless of what that solution is. A lot of times, a lot of organizations collect data and they just want to slice it all kinds of ways and try and do something with it when we should be thinking about this more holistically, more from the, uh, you know, assessing what problem we want to solve and then taking the steps to gather the, the required data later, later versus vice versa. So after we've identified our problem, we want to understand our organization's incentives. And this is huge. So a lot of times in industry, um, as a data scientist, I have been given a new data set or a project comes from marketing or sales, and they're interested in finding something interesting in the data they have. I have to sit and understand why they want this kind of project done. For example, um, one of the projects I've been asked to do in the space of uh, product analytics is to predict someone's gender based off of their name. To me, this was obviously something that we shouldn't do, um, but I needed to understand that marketing knew that our product was used by men and women drastically differently. Um, our product at the time, we had a lot more um, products that were female focused and women tended to be more frequent users and spend more. So the, at the core of the problem they were trying to solve is how do we make smarter marketing decisions in order to personalize um, you know, our, our content essentially and get people in their uh, specific demographics to buy our product. Knowing that that was the problem, I could essentially pitch, say, hey, let's do a customer segmentation project instead of trying to predict someone's gender. Being able to understand what incentives drive people to um, propose some of these projects that may seem unethical, we understand by doing that, you can understand it's not coming from a bad place the vast majority of the time. Um, but without taking this step, a lot of us tend to just kind of work on things that are assigned to us without digging deeper and asking why. So um, I implore you to use the method of the five, the five whys method um, and to try and get to the root cause of why some sketchy things might be brought up as project ideas. Um, after this is our gathering and cleaning data steps. So um, you'll also, you'll often hear that data scientists spend the vast majority of their time cleaning data. Um, for the most part, that's true. <laughs> Uh, that's because of the, the nature of real world data is so difficult to deal with. I think that's an area that's really underrated. Being good at being able to clean data is a huge, huge skill. And it's not just about, okay, I can um, correct some of the typos in the column names, but understanding why you use certain methods to replace missing data or understanding the pros and cons of um, averaging out missing data versus just dropping those columns that uh, are missing. We have to 
build this skill set a little bit more, especially when we're doing um, introductory data science and tutorials, because that's the biggest thing you'll deal with in industry and will be the most difficult thing. Um, cleaning data takes a long time because it is a lot harder to automate than a lot of our other skills. Um, and so I'd like to go in here and also talk about data documentation. So if you're someone who wants to do data science, the best thing I can suggest for you in your career is to create a data sheet for every data set you use for any toy project and to create a model card for any models you build um, for these toy or portfolio projects. This will put you within just that one step puts you within the top 5% of people doing data science in industry. There are so few people who do this deep level of documentation that unfortunately we are at the point where we're at this kind of data science reckoning. We um, have tools that are extremely under-documented and we don't really know what to do with them. Um, that being said, what this step does is it allows you to think deeper um, and have a little bit more of a social science approach to data science. What I mean by that is knowing where your data comes from requires you to ask questions like why was it collected, who it was collected by, and what uses it was collected for. We have to understand not all data was also collected for the purpose of modeling. Um, Going into exploratory analysis and inferential statistics. So um, I tend to lump these together a little bit because um, EDA essentially is really trying to glean some insights from our data. So um, we want to understand the distributions of certain columns. We wanna understand if we are looking at a medical data set, what is the age range? of our patients in this data set? Um, how many of each gender do we have in this data set? Um, and then inferential statistics goes further to really try and infer some things. So we are trying to infer the future based off of the actual data that we currently have. These two steps make it really easy to go into data storytelling. Data storytelling is kind of exactly what it sounds like. Um, being able to tell stories, not um, in a fictional way, but being able to uh, tell stories that resonate, especially with your stakeholders in industry. So um, data science is uniquely positioned in that we are, we have a lot of power and we have, a, we are well respected in our roles um, for being able to give leaders insight for being able to inform departments about decisions they should make. That being said, we need to craft stories that resonate with our stakeholders. Um, statistics, uh, stories are always better than statistics. It, it seems like we should always be straightforward and just give the numbers, but being able to um, craft a story with the beginning, a middle, and end to describe what's going on in your data set um, is an area that especially creatives can come in and leverage and be really strong at and set themselves apart. So going into um, harm mitigation and harm identification and mitigation, um, this is a huge piece that I want people, I want this to really sink in. We have to go beyond um, just glossing over the idea of ethics and explainability as saying, okay, maybe we use SHAP and LINE, and, which are uh, machine learning packages for um, understanding uh, model bias, uh, model explainability. We need to go beyond just explaining our models. We need to go beyond just creating models that can be interpreted by people. We have to understand and identify the kind of harm we can cause with our models. So this is drastically different depending on what industry you're in. A company like Netflix has the most harm of potentially um, you know, recommending you a movie you don't like. There's not a whole lot of real pain caused to people that way. Um, however, if we're thinking about healthcare or policing or housing or any other industries that are vital, this is huge. We've seen, um, actually incredibly recently, we have had uh, in 2023 arrests made by mistaken identity because of facial recognition systems. We can't keep doing this and we have to understand early on, this is part of our job. So once we're able to 
come up with ways, uh, once we're able to identify different ways we can harm people unintentionally, as well as create plans to mitigate that, then we can start creating our machine learning models. So we take a lot of um, the information we got from our exploratory analysis to try and predict or try and pick a model that we think will do well. Once we've done that, we can then um, build frameworks that allow users to appeal our model decisions. So um, a huge part of explainability and interpretability is transparency. We want to be able to have a model in production. And let's say um, a user comes to us and say, says, hey, I was denied for um, you know, this kind of housing, and I want to know why. I think that I should have been approved. We need to come up with ways to uh, then go back and look at our models and double check our work and see if we're actually predicting well overall. So I know that was a lot. Data projects include a lot. Um, but as you could see, I added a lot of extra steps here that most people don't. One of the best ways if you want to differentiate yourself or stand out is focus on these areas and you will bring so much more to organizations that most people there are already not thinking about. So some of the relevant roles um, that use data science, believe it or not, is not just a data scientist. Um, there are a lot of machine learning engineers and a lot of research scientists who leverage a lot of the same exact uh, advanced Python skills math skills, as well as communication skills um, to leverage a lot of the data science methods and concepts in their work. In this second part, I'll move on a little bit more narrow, uh, to a little bit more narrow of a focus and to the actual kind of tasks you do when you're doing data science. So um, when we think about what this actually looks like, this usually starts with collecting your data. So um, I like to call this data wrangling. It makes me think of a lasso and just like grabbing the data you need. Um, but you can use any language, any tool you want um, to access data from databases, APIs. Um, there are a lot of fancy ways you can scrape the web. I say um, with caution because there are still a lot of legal gray areas about sc uh, scraping the web. Scraping the web. Um, that being said, this piece is huge. You want to be really good at collecting data from disparate sources. And I say this because from my industry experience, um, getting and cleaning your data is not just going to take you a long time. It will probably be so much harder than you think. Uh, a lot of us think that we get to, into companies and they have perfectly clean tables and databases ready to go for data science. And that is almost always not the case especially if you're somewhere without a dedicated data engineer to help you um, create these data tables, to aggregate tables for you to run analytics on, you're going to need to be able to do this on your own. So um, some of the tools that a lot of us use are basic coding, Python, uh, SQL, and R. You can get the vast majority of the data wrangling you need done with those languages. Going into data cleaning. So um, this is really about dealing with missing values. Um, some, in some cases, combining some sparse categorical columns. This can also be dropping outliers. Um, data science is really difficult because I can't just give you one set of rules that'll work with every data set you encounter. Every data set I've worked with is have been drastically different. Um, and that's why this step takes so long. So um, you shouldn't just focus on missing values, but also trying to understand the outliers in your data. And that's really where EDA comes in. Um, let's say, for example, you're looking at medical data and your column for heart rate um, goes from zero to about 100, 120. If you start to sort this data and you see that you have you know, 50 people and their heart rate is 10,020, you'll start just having that understanding of, okay, I know what a heart rate is. I know the range this should be in. Having that kind of understanding of your data will make it so much easier to do that cleaning because you can see that and you understand that they're errors. You don't just think they're outliers of people who had a really, really high heart rate that day. Um, so that's where- <laughs> Or or, the, or they had that heart rate exactly one time. 
<laughs> just one, just one, and, and then it done. went right then, back down. Yep, yep, back to zero. And it did. Um, and in that case, even then, I would retroactively want to call their doctor. <laughs> like I'd be like, ah, right? Are you I'm sure? Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, and and believe it or not, some of that manual data verification is the job of people on data teams, um, especially when you're dealing with medical data that you can't just guess. If it's wrong, it actually has a massive impact on the kind of models you'll create. And then, so transforming data. Um, we do a lot of power transforms, scaling, and normalization to get our data into a way that makes sense for algorithms to then make predictions on. So when we talk about scaling and normalizing data, um, if you can imagine a data set that's really, really uh, wide and has a lot of different values, goes from one to up all the way up to a million, it's really hard to take a uh, column with that kind of scale and compare it to a categorical scale of like one to five. Let's say you had star ratings as well. We wanna do this scaling and normalization, normalization to get these uh, various different kinds of numerical data into a close enough range that any model could go and basically generalize off of after. So this makes this structured data easier to deal with, um, pretty much almost only for the purpose of modeling. Um, sometimes it's harder for us as humans to understand what we're looking at when we're doing log transforms. But when we feed this into especially complex models like neural networks, um, we have to worry less about uh, having errors in there that are based on not doing the scaling and normalization, especially when it's hard to figure out why our model isn't doing well, like in neural networks. Moving on to general programming. So, um, you know, this is a core part of data science, like I mentioned at the beginning, but a lot of our work is leveraging, uh, is leveraging code to create functions and make more make more concise and reusable uh, programs. I'm sorry, it's the, it's the end of the day for me too, but- uh, to Totally get it. I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm like, if I can talk, I'd continue. Um, but this is just about uh, making code concise so that it's easy to share, it's easy to run quickly, especially when we start getting to really cool machine learning that's embedded onto drones and to wearable devices. We need to have code that's re reusable um, as well as doesn't take up a lot of space. Another huge facet um, of data science is this experimental design. So we have to understand the nature of data science as a whole is incredibly experimental. A lot of what we do is iteration. We make a hypothesis, we gather the necessary data and the tools, we choose the correct methods, we were probably wrong. <laughs> we are able to go back and look at the decisions we made if we documented them. Um, we are go able to tune our models if that's the case, or maybe we just try different kinds of modeling. Um, so there are so many different machine learning algorithms. Um, it's not that we have to focus on one method or one solution. And I'll tell you now that you should focus on just being the data scientist that uses data decision trees. That's not the way to like choose a specialization in this field. Um, it's easier to be mentally flexible about the way you go about these things and then be rigid in how you assess and evaluate your results. So um, you should be really stringent with your models. And when I say that, um, we want to set a baseline of how well a model should do. So if we think about, you know, we are just predicting um, the difference between cats and dogs. If our model is only 20% accurate, okay, maybe that's not something we roll out, but, um, you know, how do we have a good baseline for this? And this is another step we take in experimental design um, in this hypothesis testing phase, uh, phase specifically. Uh, so moving to concepts, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the goals and methods uh, that we use in data science. So uh, getting a little bit more narrow, but I'm not going to go too deep. Um, the goal for almost all data science projects is to predict some kind of future event based on the historical data we have. So 
Um, we can also find things like anomalies. Uh, we use that, especially in cybersecurity focused data science, when we're trying to find um, threats or trying to find events that um, should not have occurred. Uh, and in other cases, we might be making recommendations based off of someone's interest. So um, Spotify often looks at the things that you like to try and predict you a new song. We have to consider always that we are looking at past data. With that comes all of the problems with the historical artifacts that are in that data. Um, it's important to know that there are proxies for the protected classes that we try not to predict on, like race and gender. Um, for a credit card application, you wouldn't want the biggest factor to be, uh, you know, someone's gender, however, um, or someone's race. Um, but it is the case that we do use things like zip codes, and zip codes actually a huge proxy for race, especially in the United States. Um, we have to think about historically how this country has developed, um, how land at has developed processes like redlining um, that real estate uh, investors and real estate uh, developers have used to build and structure how people live in this country. Despite the fact that we are in 20, almost 2021, um, decades after this has happened, that his, those historical artifacts are still in our data. So with things like zip code and with things like weight that often correlate to gender, we have to understand that all of the things in the past, we are codifying with our code. We are not um, unbiasing or debiasing any past decisions just by putting this data into a model and having a model do that. So going into methods, um, this is a very simplified version of what data science is in a nutshell. So we clean our data so that it's in a good format that we can input to model. We want to understand the distributions of our data. Um, and this, it really just informs our model selection. This will help us decide if we should use a decision tree or if we should use a neural network or a support vector machine. It's not important that um, you, know, you know the names of these things, but um, as you get further along, just understanding the pros and cons and understanding the kinds of data you can use them on is huge. Um, and then we perform exploratory data analysis to, like I mentioned, extract uh, insights from our data sets. Um, really, we're, when I say insights, we're extracting some statistics. So we are looking at the standard deviation of some columns. We're looking at the spread of values for some columns. And then we choose modeling techniques that are gonna help us solve this problem. Uh, then we move into measuring how well these models perform and then we can optimize them. Um, we can tune multiple different parameters like how many um, examples they look at in a single batch or how long to run a neural network for or how many splits to make in a decision tree. There are so many different options um, and so much we can do to tune these models. That you can think of them as tiny little knobs that we switch to create slightly different models that hopefully predict better. Then we iterate on this process over and over again <laughs> until we are uh, happy with essentially our model outcome. I like going into exploratory data analysis a little bit more. Um, you'll often hear it shortened as EDA, um, but this is a very basic definition. So this is a way of analyzing data that we're able to just summarize main statistics um, typically, we make a ton of plots, scatter plots, and histograms to understand um, and visually see the difference in, in the data, like I've mentioned. So um, it is sometimes the case we use a statistical model like linear regression or log logistic regression, but it's not always so. Sometimes we just need to um, understand the different categories in our data set, um, and that can help us identify what models we want to go forward with. Adding a little bit more into this machine learning side of data science, um, I'm only going to cover some of the really high level uh, pieces, but it's really important that you understand that regression is just a way to predict numbers. If you look at this, uh, you know, very simple chart, 
you'll see that uh, the black dots, uh, that that's just our data. That is the spread of our data. Um, and what regression does is we're just trying to predict a line, like the blue line you see going through the dots the best. A lot of times um, this will help us identify linear relationships, but really what we care about is that the, the line is drawn in a way that the error is reduced. So that's the difference between the dot and the line. Yeah, you could draw per se a, a line that goes up and down between these, but what we have to understand is if we do that, we're creating a regression model that is overfit or it fits the data so well that it isn't going to do well at predicting uh, in the future. So what we want, and you can think about it this way, um, what we want to do with something like regression is create a boundary so that if we see new examples above the line or below the line, we'll be able to um, just predict the value of them a little bit better. Moving into classification, um, this is just a really fancy way of trying to tell different things apart. So if we're looking at news articles, um, we can classify them by category, whether it's fashion, um, sports or technology or something else. Um, classification also works when we're looking at things like image data. Um, you'll hear the hot dog or not hot dog or the uh, cat versus dog classifier uh, commonly referenced. This is just trying to tell things apart um, based off of their characteristics. Clustering is another method we use in data science and in, it's a little bit different than both regression and classification in that we already have data points and what we want is to cluster them or classify them um, by how far apart they are. So for clustering methods to work, we really assume that um, you know, birds of a feather flock together. So data points that are similar are located similar to each other on a plot. Um, while that's not always the case and really not the case for nonlinear data, we can use clustering methods to help us um, just understand data better and understand um, the kinds of groupings that we have in our data set. We can use clustering also in things like natural language processing for topic modeling. So if you gave a, um, an algorithm a ton of different news articles, it could pick out different topics based off of the really frequently used words and say that some things talk about sports teams losing and some articles mention, um, you know, the pandemic and the election more than others. So clustering is a really interesting method to use. Um, let's predict about the future and more have better understanding about the past. You can also leverage reinforcement learning, which is really fun. Um, and what is the closest most data scientists uh, get to, do, to doing real AI? So um, this is where autonomous agents are basically set free on an environment and they're able to make new decisions based on their reward or the punishment function. So um, an agent we can think of as a Roomba. Right, so um, a Roomba gets rewarded every time it rolls over a piece of dirt and picks up the dirt. So after learning its environment and doing this a ton of times, it's going to keep repeating the actions that give it a reward. However, um, as we've seen with a lot of really viral um, Roomba accidents, this doesn't mean that it's optimized or it's a true AI or it understands anything about its real environment. Roombas will continually and uh, have a problem cleaning up dog poop um, until it spreads it around <laughs> the entire house. And instead of actually cleaning it, it keeps getting rewarded for thinking it's doing the right thing. Uh, you can Google the catastrophe <laughs> if you'd like to see the path, the Roomba's actual path, but um, reinforcement learning is, is close uh, to what we can think of as AI that is in use right now. So moving into getting some hands-on experience. So um, this is the part that is usually really hard for people just starting out. It was really hard for me starting out. Um, it really comes from practice. 
and from consistent practice. So um, not letting your skills in these technical areas slip because it's really easy to do that, um, especially when you're just starting and you're trying to learn it all while not being overwhelmed by how much there is to learn. So the first step I suggest for people is to find a data set they find interesting. If you are at the stage where maybe you've um, dabbled with data science for a little bit and you're looking to move into moving into getting a role, I can I would try and create a couple portfolio projects, maybe two to three. Out of those, reserve one for for a passion project. So um, one of my projects in my master's program. Uh, was actually on predicting hockey goals. I'm a huge hockey fan. It had nothing to do with real world data science or KPIs or metrics that matter in industry. Um, but being able to spark that area of interest. I've done a lot of projects um, using things like Megan Thee Stallion lyrics. There, there's no um, one way to be a data scientist or one way to put together a portfolio. Um, but with that, I also like to mention, um, you know, try and gear some of these projects to the things that people in the industry do care about. Um, try and stay away from toy projects like Titanic data set and the Iris data set, just because it's really hard to stand out. Um, a lot of interviewers and hiring managers have seen that a lot on resumes. So um, trying to find unique data sets is always the first step. It'll be something that helps you pique your interest more and lets you play around with somewhat of what real life data looks like. And then really work on your cleaning and manipulation skills. So um, you wanna be able to grasp the basic techniques and then build an intuition for when to use them. I really focus on that second part because that's what you'll be asked in interviews. That's what um, you know people in industry really care about. Do you know when to use one method over another? This really comes from practice. Again, there's there's um, no cheat sheet I can really give, hand you and say it will work for everything. But what you can do is just start building your skills. So um, if you're already in analytics uh, or, or not, I still suggest becoming very strong at Excel. Um, I have yet to be at a data science job where I haven't touched it. I would next focus on your SQL skills. So um, being able to retrieve your own data is a huge, huge um, aspect to doing data science well. There are a lot of very large organizations and FANG organizations that have dedicated data engineers and maybe somewhat shelter most data scientists from this kind of work. I will say in my experience, uh, I have had to get all my own data. So being able to access databases, do joins, be able to um, filter out null records are really, really important skills as well as being able to do some data manipulation and either R or Python. Um, the vast majority of data science roles will be testing you or giving you some kind of coding questions in one of these two languages. And then getting practice. So um, yes, you can find some data, start cleaning your data, but it's hard to know where to go from there sometimes. So I have really leaned on um, tutorials on Medium, Analytics, Fidia, GitHub, looking at um, pre-COVID more uh, data hackathons, but you can really leverage MOOCs here. And when I say leverage, I mean, you may not use them like normal user. Um, I like to pick and choose the, the specific content I need and have it teach me a section and then go implement that on my own. Try and come back to it and see if you've gotten the correct uh, solutions or to see if you truly grasp what you're doing. I don't suggest for most people to try and sit through an online course, um, especially one that was relatively cheap as in under $25, because it's, it's very hard to stay on top of it. And many of us, when we get to sections or videos that we're, we feel like we already know the answer or we already know it, we have a huge drop off and actually going back to that course, regardless of if there's still relevant information there. So um, be the weirdest MOOC user and make them very confused when they're looking at your user stats, but sign up for multiple courses. I am probably enrolled in over 50 like Udemy, Coursera, and Udacity courses and highlight the sections that are important 
bookmark those and go back to them when you need them. Um, you don't have to sit an entire content, uh, sit through an entire course if it's not all relevant to you. And a question that I get a lot um, is if you need a formal education or not to be a data scientist. The real answer is no, you don't need a formal education, but it will make things easier for a lot of people. I suggest for people um, to use this to uh, actually try and guide that decision a little bit. So um, if you're someone who already has some existing knowledge in programming or data science, um, it's a little bit easier for you to maybe take the boot camp route or to take the self-taught route. Um, if not, like if you're someone like me who is brand, brand new, um, I went to a graduate program. <laughs> that was kind of the end of my road there. Um, but you also want to consider how long this should take. So um, some people want to be in a new career, especially with the impact of the pandemic, within the next six months or some people want to be in a new career in the next year. Understanding how, if it's genuinely okay with you, if it takes a while, will really help you make this decision as well, as well as your current position. Um, if you have the ability to learn on the job, learn on the job. <laughs> I will suggest that every single time. Um, if you are in a role where um, they pay for tuition reimbursement, maybe I would consider a graduate program um, and work with your employer that way. But for a lot of people, thinking about just your prior knowledge, the um, amount of time you want to transition and uh, the ability, how much ability you have to learn where you currently are is gonna make this decision a lot easier for you. And lastly, I don't wanna forget, you can still market yourself while you're learning. This is something I actually wish I did a lot more of, um, but some people even just start blogs that just go down their learning path and that um, people are able to look down, look at that and say, okay, I can see how your knowledge has developed over time. What I try to mention for people to do here is really be able to communicate your value. This is the most important thing when you are at that interview stage or um, trying to convince someone that you really know what you're doing in the science. You wanna talk about how you've impacted your past businesses, which can be things from, I mean, I've been doing, I've done freelance work on Upwork um, in data science, whether it is pro bono data science work, whether it's an internship, being able to have a solid metric and said, I did X, I was able to impact our business by this percentage is going to be huge. And it's gonna be one of the things that people are most attracted to when they hear you talk about your skills, as well as how, if you know how to qual quantify your value. So um, one of the best ways to really show this off is to have a good GitHub. Um, I would admit my GitHub is not the most impressive in the world, but I have a good personal website to offset that. Um, <laughs> but it's just a great way. <laughs> All of all of my um, all of my industry data science work has either been on like a GitHub adjacent like GitLab, or um, is has not been measured on GitHub uh, internally. So people go to mine and they're like, "You don't really code a lot," um, but it is one way, especially if you already have a software background or a coding background. Um, to show that transition, to show that you can do a lot of this work in data science and machine learning technically. And if not, um, really show it off on your personal website. This could be your blog on Medium, um, anything that you have control over to show your learning path, to consistently um, show that you understand what you're talking about. So um, I, I'll give you an example from my own life. My most popular post on Medium um, was actually a post I created as a take home for a job interview. So they wanted me to summarize a, any paper, any paper on data science. Um, what was recent at the time was uh, Facebook actually created a new, po a new kind of loss function called focal loss. I read the paper, I summed it up and this paper has been the most popular thing and it has earned me all of my like 35 cents on, on Medium, which is way more than anything else had. People love seeing that technical content, but it should be important for you to carve out a niche. Um, for me, I have a marketing and communications background. 
So I tend to do a lot of talks. I tend to be, um, you know, the uh, voice of the data science department. I tend to be comfortable going out and presenting, but that's not what your thing has to be. Um, I do suggest, especially considering how competitive data science and machine learning is, that you do start to carve out a specialization. For some people, this can be interest-based. So if you're interested in computer vision or if you're interested in natural language processing, but this can also be um, kind of career focused. So some people really wanna be researchers and really wanna publish research papers. Um, by picking that specialization or by understanding how to dabble in a little bit of everything early on, it will be way easier for you to pick that specialization down the line. So um, with your blog or your personal website, share your expertise. A lot of that for me comes from talking about industry and career data science. Um, but while you're starting, talk about the things that are difficult for you to learn. Um, there's a huge chance that it's probably not on Stack Overflow yet. Um, the errors you're running into, people love to see you solve these things in public. Um, and by being able to do that, you will catch the eye of a lot of recruiters and hiring managers that you didn't expect. Um, and then show off your portfolio. So if you do have projects, I really suggest, um, even if it's a very basic Python and Django uh, web app, or um, you know, having a level of interactivity or having a level of advanced visual visualizations is gonna be really helpful. Um, and my biggest tip here is really just to provide insight into your thought process. So out of all of the data science interviews I've done, um, out of the ones I've conducted, the number one question is always trying to answer how does this person think through a problem? Whether um, it's asked in one way or another, that's what a lot of us are trying to get to. So if you can show that off earlier on in the process, it'll be a lot easier for you down the line. And that is it for me. So I am really excited. Um, I've actually just published this book, um, Getting Started in Data Science. Um, so I'm hoping that it can be helpful for you guys. Um, with that being said, y'all can get it for 25% off. Um, v Brown bag is the code. Um, and please feel free to follow me on Twitter, Instagram at Data SciBay. But um, I am trying to help as many people as I can. I had a really hard time transitioning into this field, um, not only being underestimated, but also having a not completely non-technical background, um, a very remedial math background. And I want you to know it's possible. It's not as hard as it seems. Not that. Nice. I had to, I had to capture the uh, the um, the the code the twenty five percent off code and then yeah. and then post that out. Thank you very much for that. That's uh, that's very generous of you. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll, I'll make sure that I span that okay. that piece out there. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So so um, we've we've got uh, several questions. I cannot turn my video back on. Um, oh no. The the thing that you were having with me when I was the host, I I, mm. I am now experiencing it. But that's okay. That's okay. We we can. It's it's not that big of a deal. Everybody wants to see more of you. So I'm totally fine with that. Okay. So so from the top, um, actually let's let's go let's go in reverse order. Uh, is a graduate program 100% necessary if you don't have an existing data science exposure or programming knowledge? Uh, based, I'm, I'm assuming that they're looking at your graph that you had up and it said, okay. if you don't have that, then no, then definitely then graduate school. Is there an alternative to graduate school or is, or is that the, the, the good path? I would say it is the, it is the fastest path. Mm -hmm. but is not the only by any by any means. So um, let's say you don't have like any background data science knowledge. Um, what I would suggest is a combination of self teaching and self learning, and maybe a boot camp mm -hmm. or some kind of um, um, I, I got to find a good way to say this like upgraded um, uh, MOOC course. So on Udacity, I believe they have like nano degrees. Treehouse mm. has like their tech degree. Um, those are a lot cheaper options, mm -hmm. but uh, with no with no experience whatsoever, you still don't 100% need a, a graduate degree. And I say that as I know a lot of data scientists who don't even have a bachelor's degree or don't have a related bachelor's degree. Um, so not the only option, uh, but it is a little bit harder and will take a little bit more time. What you can right, do course. is um, 
just try and learn on your own. Uh, you leverage a lot of online tools until you can do something like a boot camp, which many require coding experience or some right. Kind of experience. Right. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, a comment from uh, one of our listeners right now, Sia Seiko said that data science for all is free on Saturdays and spring applications are open. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. What, do, do, are you familiar with that? Yes, um, I am. So data science for all is a program. Um, I know it starts in a couple of months, but um, it is a free Saturday taught uh, program by, it's taught by like Stanford and Harvard professors um, oh. for those interested in data science. Um, so that is a amazing option. I actually, um, I've got a link to that too that I can send you if you'd like, <laughs> like to attach, but. Um, yeah, yeah, send, send me the link and I'll put it in the show notes for, okay. uh, for, the, for, the, for the YouTube uh, recording for this. Excellent, okay, okay. thank you. Thank you uh, and Sia as well for, for mentioning that. Okay, uh, next question. Okay, so, so this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this one question an amalgam of several mm -hmm. questions because they, were, okay. they, they all came around at the same time um, and they all have the same thread. Uh, is there an ethics checklist or some form of like ethics? So, so the first question was, is predicting gender bad? Uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the, ne the next question was, wait, then, then what else is there out there that I don't know about that's bad? And then there was, is there a best, is, is there a checklist for ethics? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, well, we'll get into this. So is predicting gender bad first? Um, for the most part, yes. And that's maybe not for the reason you think. Um, it's not because predicting a specific column is bad. Um, mm -hmm. We have to think about the nuances and complications with gender. Um, the first being that, especially in the United States, the way that um, employers collect data, uh, data on gender is uh, by uh, federal guidelines. So um, they typically just ask male, female, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, what we do lose is we lose a lot of people who are transgender, um, people who are non-binary, right, who right. Um, are forced to be in one of these two binary options that we give them. We have to start seeing pretty much all gender data that we only gave like two options for as biased. They're biased because people are being still forced to choose a, an answer that's not as accurate as it could be. So with that being said, predicting gender is bad when we want to just advertise to people based off of their gender. If I just said, y'all are dudes, I want to like spam all the dudes on my app with like this ad. Yes, we run into ethical quandaries. Um, however, in some cases, like some health healthcare models, it is actually really important to know someone's gender in order to um, understand and appropriate the right kinds of medical treatment. So in that gotcha. case, okay. um, we're not predicting gender, but it can be used in a way that's not um, unethical. Gotcha, okay, cool, all right. Um, this, this one is oddly specific. Um, is AWS SageMaker clarify uh, and I, had, I, I Googled this while they were at, while, while when they came yeah. up, because I was like, wait, what's that? Uh, cl so Clarify is the, is the bias scrubber in SageMaker, which is, which is, the, which is the, the machine learning thing that, that AWS has out. Are you familiar with that? They're, they're, they're asking for your opinion on Somewhat. it. Somewhat. Okay. I can't, I can't give you a solid opinion because I have not used it as a uh, very in-depth. <laughs> okay, because because that one dovetailed in with the ethics and and uh, the the bias and modeling stuff. So I was I was trying to to make make that sound better than I came out. Never mind. Disregard. No worries. Um, you're good. Okay. Uh, uh, Sia is asking: Is there going to be a print version version of your book that's going to be coming out? Yes, I am really really excited. So I've had a lot of requests for a print version. Um, and I actually found a um, really awesome publisher that I'll be working with to get print versions, hopefully by Q2 at the very latest, but hopefully earlier. Um, I can also, I, I should probably set up a like email or sign up for that, but more details soon. <laughs> Yeah, you should to totally put something on your website uh, if you're interested in a, in yeah. a print book. Uh, get get on this list. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Destiny Blackman. Uh, thank you again for sharing all this information. I'm planning to go back to school and wanted to know of your experience at Regis. Regis, uh, mm -hmm. did you take math prerequisites and the GRE before applying to better your chances as a non-tech person mm -hmm. attempting to enter the field? 
Ah, so good question. Um, one of the reasons I chose Regis is they did not make me. Um, while I had taken my GRE, I think it expired like weeks before um, <laughs> I applied to Regis. So they do not require it, which is awesome. Um, and that being said, especially because of pandemic, most um, larger universities are also not requiring GRE for most master's programs and some PhD programs. So um, not just Regis, but um, before uh, before starting there, I actually spoke to um, the head of the data science program. I said, look, um, I sat down with him in person when we could. I was like, so I don't have the stats requirement, um, but I've taken a lot of coding classes in my undergrad. Is that okay? And he's like, look, I will, you know, allow you to do some like MOOC stat courses. I did like a couple of things on Udemy and Udacity, um, and they did admit me to the program without having a more formal um, math course under my belt. So um, they are a nice small private school, so you might be able to get away with just having a conversation with them. Um, <laughs> nice. And program wise, um, I enjoyed the program. I do feel like it was a little bit early when I uh, I think this was the second year it existed when I when I was uh, enrolled, um, and I do know they made a lot of advancements to the program. So now they also have actually um, a data engineering specialization, which is huge. I've not seen a lot of um, data science or analytics focused um, programs have really any kind of specializations in ML or data engineering. Um, but not only that, uh, one of the things I did enjoy is that they have more ethics courses uh, in their curriculum than uh, a lot of other schools. So it was still a requirement. Um, I do wish I had been dealing with a little bit more dirty data. And I will warn this for everyone doing a MOOC, a tutorial, a grad school, you will not be prepared when you start seeing this real life data. Um, so <laughs> having that mentality now and knowing that, um, don't just, just because it is easy to create models, um, especially when you're doing these courses, doesn't mean it will be as easy when you're creating uh, models outside, outside of these uh, smaller data sets. You mean in the real world, things are messy and dirty ah, and that, that's, that's so crazy talk. Worse. That's crazy talk. So much worse than you could imagine. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I was unprepared, I'll be honest. What uh, so so I I do mentor um, some some college students that are getting into the industry, um, as uh, in, like like t you know teaching them like the basics of IT and stuff like that and you know how to how to get in, and that's exactly one of the th the first things that I tell them is that all of all of the pretty learning that you're doing right now is in a clean pristine environment. And yeah. then, and then you're going to get out into the real world, and you're going to run. We call, we call it the eighth, the the eighth layer of the OSI model. And that's that's mm -hmm. the that's the human layer. There's 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 everything else, and then there's the humans on top of it, and that just makes makes everything weird. <laughs> I like to I like to think about it like when you're bowling. As far you can have like the little garters up, and it, it makes sense. You have to understand the basics and the techniques. Right. Um, so school and education puts up those boundaries, but instead of those little gutters, imagine the entire rest of the bowling alley was the real world. Right. right. Um, so you are seeing <laughs> just a little bit of what the what the iceberg looks like. That's a really good analogy. Awesome. Very cool. Thanks. Cool. Okay. Uh, I I think I think that not only have we we. <gasps> We couldn't have timed this better. We we ran up to exactly one hour and we ran out of questions. This is fantastic. Nice. It never gets this good. This, this is the best thing 2020 has to offer. Oh, I appreciate that. Look, look, I know that's a low bar for the year, but I'll take it. <laughs> we can't even get my camera to work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll zoom. Great awesome. Though. So Ayodele, thank you so much for, for coming on. This was yeah. this was absolutely fantastic. Um, we, we are we are definitely leaving the year on a high note having you on. This this was this was thank you so much. Wonderful, full of knowledge, and and um, this this was a great presentation. I, I couldn't have asked for a more fun way to, to end the year. <laughs> That's all I can do is try. I appreciate it, Chris. Thank you so much for having me on. This is awesome.
Cool. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, we will see you again next year. Uh, what we are planning on, um, be because because of this episode and and because of the uh, interest generated in this episode, we are now starting to consider running a series of how to how to be X. Uh, we've got data science under our belt now, and uh, and we've got some people interested in talking about programming, uh, cloud architecture, um, developer advocates, um, uh, cybersecurity experts. Uh, so we, we've got some stuff coming down the pipe. Please stay tuned, and thank you all once again. We'll talk to you soon.